think will continue to be Americans, Virginians, committed to the rule of law. Today, let us as a commission yet again confirm our commitment to the rule of law. As such, we humbly ask you that our debate and decisions be honest and forthright. For this we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Mr. Tankard, for the invocation. At the present time, had an opportunity to look over the agenda. Are there any additions, corrections, or deletions to the agenda by members of staff or members of the commission? Mr. Commissioner, this is Tony Watkinson, Mr. Chief of the Watkinson. Habitat Management Division. Yes, sir. Uh, we need to pull one of our page two items that had been listed on the agenda, Kalana Shipyard, number 19, 1957. Uh, we received a protest late last Friday that we'll need to resolve before we bring that back to the commission. All right, Mr. Watkinson, thank you very much for that. Any other additions, corrections, or deletions? If not, the chair will entertain a motion. John Zedrin here. I move to approve the agenda as amended. Is there a second to the motion? So Mr. Moved, Abbott, second. Mr. Tankard seconds. Mr. France. Mr. France. I think that was an aye. Mr. Tankard. Aye. Mr. Zedrin. Aye. Dr. Neal. Aye. Mr. Miner. Ms. Lusk? Aye. Ms. Everett? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion passes. You've had an opportunity to review the minutes of the previous meeting. Are there any additions, directions, or additions, corrections, or deletions to the minutes by members of the commission? If not, the chair will entertain a motion. Ed Tankard, I move we adopt the minutes from our last meeting. Motion by Mr. Tanker to adopt the minutes. Is there a second? Second, Dr. Neal. Thank you, Dr. Neal. Mr. France? Aye. Thank you. Mr. Tankard? Aye. Uh, Mr. Zedrin? I'm going to abstain since I wasn't here last the meeting. Thank you, sir. Dr. Neal? Aye. Mr. Ballard is absent. Mr. Miner? Ms. Lusk? Aye. Ms. Everett? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion passes. At this time, we would have any, do we have any consent agenda items for the uh, commission, Mr. Watkinson? No, sir, we did not. All right, thank you. Ms. Block, is there any need to have a closed meeting with the uh, Office of the Attorney General for briefing by council? No. Thank you, Ms. Block. But he skipped over one page two. I believe we still have one page two item that needs to be resolved. That's correct. Could you proceed with that, please? Yes, sir. Before, uh, before you proceed, it's, as far as all staff is concerned, you saw me swear the testimony that you give today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Yes, sir, I do. Proceed with page two item. Okay, uh, Mr. Commissioner, associate members, uh, we have one remaining page two item today. This is for a project over $500,000 in project cost and therefore requiring commission approval and subjected to our public interest review. We have no objections and staff is recommending approval. In this case, it is project by uh, Wagman Heavy Civil Incorporated are requesting authorization to install temporary bridges, recon reconfigure the existing I-95 southbound construction causeway, construct three new traffic lanes parallel and adjacent to the I-95 northbound bridge across the Rappahannock River, 
and construct improvements over Falls Run to, to provide additional capacity and facilitate construction of the I-95 northbound Rappahannock River crossing project in the city of Fredericksburg and Stafford County. We're recommending approval contingent upon our standard in-stream permit conditions, a muscle survey and relocation prior to construction, and an in-stream work time of year restriction of February 15 to June 30, and August 15 to September 30 of any year to protect anatomous fishes and freshwater mussels, unless specifically waived in writing by the Department of Wildlife Resources. In this case, we would uh, require that the permit execute a transfer of this permit to the Virginia Department of Transportation upon their acceptance of the permitted structures. Be happy to try and answer any questions that you might have. Any questions for Mr. Washington by members of the commission? Thank you. There being none, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone in the public that wishes to be heard on this matter for or against? They're hearing none. The chair will entertain a motion. Move to approve staff recommendations, Dr. Neal. Thank you, Dr. Neal. Is there a second to the motion? John Zedrin, second. second. Thank you, Mr. Zedrin. Mr. France. Mr. France. Mr. Tankard. Aye. Mr. Zedrin. Aye. Dr. Neal. Aye. Mr. Miner. Ms. Lusk. Aye. Ms. Everett. Aye. Recalling Mr. France. Hi, I apologize. I'm getting delay. That's okay. Um, if if you're having if you're having a consistent delay, what I'll do is I'll just wait um, uh, a little bit longer before I go to the next person. It seems to be that's the case at every time. So uh, we'll just wait on you. We have plenty of time. Chair votes aye. Motion passes. Next item I have on the agenda is the Virginia Electric and Power Company number 19-1217. And that will be Mr. Eversoll. Yes, sir. You've been sworn. Proceed, please. Virginia, <clears throat> Virginia Electric and Power Company requests authorization to remove two 230 kV overhead electric transmission circuits and associated support structures and to install by micro tunneling technology two. 60 inch diameter steel conduits housing two 230 kV electric transmission circuits, a minimum 16 feet beneath 344 foot and 379 foot sub wide sections of four mile run, including temporary impacts to tidal wetlands and state owned submerged bottom for the installation of timber mat access roads, floating work platforms, and sheet pile coffer dams immediately upstream of the Route 1 bridge crossing in Arlington County in the city of Alexandria. This project requires a tidal wetland permit and a subaqueous permit. Next slide, please. Here's a location map. You'll see uh, the, the project is in the Black Star. The Potomac River running north-south in the middle of the slide in Washington, D.C. to the top of the picture. Next slide. Here's a little closer view. The project area is in the black hatched area. Four mile run runs east and west basically through the uh, project area. Reagan National Airport is in the top right of the picture. And four mile run is the, is the boundary between Arlington County to the north and the city of Alexandria to the south. You'll be acting today as the wetland board for Arlington County. Next slide. This is an aerial of the project view of the project site. The two yellow orange parallel lines are the two 60 inch diameter conduits, which will be installed beneath four mile run. 
once those conduits are in place and the electric lines are run through and, and energized, the overhead lines will be removed and the two towers circled in red will be removed. Next slide, please. This is just a plan view showing the same work area. The two black hatched lines are the uh, 60 inch diameter conduits which will go under the river. The two yellow highlighted structures are the towers and support structures which will be removed. At the bottom of the slide, you'll see the cross section which shows that the micro tunneling will be 16 feet beneath four mile run for those two conduits. Next slide. I wanted to go ahead and give you some ground shots so you can see the size of these structures we're talking about. This is the structure which sits in four mile run. You'll see the number of overhead lines, the metal tower, and the concrete support structure which the tower sits on. Next slide. Another view of the, the tower in four mile run. Next slide. This is the tower that sits in non-vegetated tidal wetlands along the northern shore of Four Mile Run in Arlington County. Next slide. And this is just a closer view. You can see the metal pole, the concrete support structure, which is encased in uh, sheet piling and is uh, supported further by uh, concrete and possibly timber pilings, which were driven into Four Mile Run. Next slide. These are just uh, some shots of uh, plans provided by Dominion Power showing those concrete support structures. Next slide. More of the same from Dominion Power. Next slide. This is a, this is a plan view of the structure which will be installed in tidal wetlands and subaqueous bottom or it will be removed from the tidal wetlands. In the orange hatched box, that's the work area which will be encased in sheet pile coffer dams. All of the work on this structure for removal will be done from the upland. Next slide. This is the structure which sits out in four mile run. Again, the orange hatching, which is hard to see, but it surrounds that uh, concrete support pile. That will be encased in the coffer dams and work will be done in the dry. The black outline is the, uh, will be the floating mats, which will be installed to support the work activities and, and uh, equipment. You'll also notice the blue hatched area along the northern shore of Four Mile Run. That was an area of uh, SAV, likely a freshwater mix of SAV which was present in calendar year 2017. The VIMS five-year report from 2014 to 2018 shows that there was SAV only in the calendar year 2017. We asked Stantec, the consultant, to do a uh, SAV survey out there, which they conducted in June of this year and found no SAV present. We followed that with a site visit with Corey Gray from Stantec and Emily Hine from VIMS. And at that time we saw no, that was in July of this year, we saw no SAV present. Next slide. This is a shot provided by the contractor showing the tower and support column in the lower right corner to be removed. Yeah, the timber floating, not timber, I'm sorry, the floating mats are shown which will support the two cranes shown in yellow, which will be used to remove that structure. Next slide. And one final overhead aerial showing in green, the SAV, which was present in 2017, and the two structures circled in red, which will be removed. Next slide. VIMS provided written comments uh, noting that Four Mile Run is an anadromous fish, uh, known habitat for anadromous fish, and they recommend a time of year restriction from February 15 through June 30 of any year 
uh, no in-stream work during that time period unless it's within the coffer dams. They also note the bed of submerged aquatic, ve aquatic vegetation, which was uh, very dense in 2017, likely a mix of freshwater species. They go on to talk about the proposed impacts of this bit are temporary, resulting from matting for equipment access to remove the support structures once the transmission line has been moved underground. This portion of the project will occur near the end of the project timeline, and the SAV may recolonize the area prior to that time. Freshwater SAV restoration is challenging, and consequently, VIMS recommends that the impacts be minimized by conducting construction activities during winter months when SAV is dormant and ensuring that bottom contours are restored post construction. So, combined with the anadromous fish time of year restriction, VIMS recommends that the in stream construction occur from early November through February 15 to be most protective of the aquatic resources. Next slide, please. So in summary, staff recognizes and appreciates the comments provided by VIMS concerning potential SAV impacts. However, we also understand the constraints placed on the permittee by limiting in-stream work to approximately three months in winter conditions. Placement of mats and cranes, the deconstruction and removal of the overhead lines, and the metal tower and support structure followed by the removal of cranes and access mats in winter conditions could be a lengthy process. The ability to begin this work prior to early November would improve the odds of all work in SAV beds be completed before the February 15th start of time of year restriction. Accordingly, after evaluating the merits of the project and considering all the factors contained in section 28.2, 1302.10b, and 28.2.1205 of the Code of Virginia and the Wetlands Mitigation Compensation Policy and Supplemental Guidelines, staff recommends approval of the project as proposed with the following special conditions added to the permit. Next slide, please. One, a time of year restriction protective of anadromous fish species shall be imposed. No in-stream work is allowed between February 15 and June 30 of any year. Two, if there is no SAV present, in-stream work can begin July 1 of that year. However, should SAV be present, then in-stream work in all areas of SAV shall not commence until September 1st. All temporary access matting shall be removed by February 14 to allow for recolonization of SAV during the time of year restriction. All areas of state-owned submerged land and adjacent lands disturbed by this activity shall be restored to their original contours and natural conditions within 30 days from the date of completion of the authorized work. All excess materials shall be removed to an upland site and contained in a manner to prevent its re-entry into state waters. A royalty in the amount of $2,169 shall be charged for the encroachment of the 260-inch diameter steel conduits beneath 723 linear feet of state-owned submerged land at a rate of $3 per linear foot. And finally, the horizontal directional drill inadvertent return plan developed for the project dated June 28, 2019, shall be attached to and become a part of the permit. Next slide, please. That's the end of my presentation. I'll remind the commission that you are acting as the wetland board for Arlington County and also a subaqueous permit for the micro tunneling beneath four mile run. Uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. I know Corey Gray with Stantec is on the line. I, I'm not sure, I've not noted, I've not seen anyone from Dominion Power, but they could be. So I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Great presentation. Um, does anyone have any questions of Mr. Eversole by members of the commission? Mr. Commissioner, I have one question. Mr. Tankard, proceed, please. It's, it's, it's certainly quite an impressive project. And I just have a question when, when in our um, recommendations, we talk about restore, restoration to original contours and natural conditions. Uh, is compaction part of that? I would I would guess that uh, it's going to be hard for that grass to come back if it's 
mush down to a tight soil type? Um, I can let uh, Mr. Johnson or if Vims would like to answer, but I will tell you that having seen a number of these projects before, that stuff is pretty resilient and can come back. But uh, let's do this. Um, Mr. Barnell, are you on? Yes, Mr. Commissioner, but I would defer to uh, Ms. Hine for this, and she did the site visit and and uh, developed our comments. Okay. Um, you. Identify yourself, please, and respond to the question. Stanford. Good morning. This is Emily Hine from VIMS. Um, Good morning, Emily. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, my understanding is that the um, timber mats and floating mats uh, proposed for the work should minimize the compaction to the river bottom. Um, in regards to restoring contours, um, primarily concerned with if the if the water level is too deep um, to allow adequate sunlight to uh, the SAV that would be present, so that it would be unable to grow in the future. Okay. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense, and I appreciate you helping us with that. Thank you. Yeah. Any further questions for for Vims, for members of the commission? Can you may ask a follow up to that question? Yes, ma'am. You sure may, Ms. Everett, for the record. Thank you. Um, so, to Ms. Hine, I guess the question is: is um, increasing that depth? Is there a way to, without kind of, I guess, going to a more shallow, um, conservative um, depth that might adequately provide sunlight, what are some options there to address that concern? I'm not sure I understand your question. Are you asking how contours could be restored? I guess what I thought I heard you say was that the depth would be um, increased to the extent where water clarity can't get to that SAV, and I just didn't know if that concern was satisfied or it remains a concern. Ah, that concern um, would be if after the construction access materials were removed, if the bottom contours of the river um, were deeper than they were prior to that construction activity. Um, you know, so if, if there were, you know, large, um, you know, excavated areas, um, things like that, that were pockets of deeper water that would not be uh, sufficient. Uh, habitat for SAV. Um, we would like those uh, those contour those you know that bottom surface restored to the pre-construction conditions. Thank you. So it sounds like it was addressed. I'm sorry. Thanks for clarity. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Ever Thank you, Ms. Everett. Mr. I'm going to ask one more question of Mr. Eversole. You you can ask 2,700 if you'd like, but it's, <laughs> you're more dangerous. than welcome to. Me. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Um, one quick question. Who is it that determines the presence of SAV pre-construction? Is that the Stantec or SIMS or? I, I think that would be Stantec and Dominion Power. However, there's also a permit, a standard permit condition that uh, staff, VMRC staff be notified 15 days prior to the commencement of work. And at that time, we could go out and, and do a field check if, if there was and yes, if there was any doubt that there was SAV present or not present. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Further questions for Mr. Eversole, members of the commission? Um, Mr. Eversole, you said that you believe that Corey Gray was staying tech. Is Mr. Gray on the line? Mr. Corey Gray. All right, there we go. Can you hear me now? I can, sir. Um, Thank you. Would you like to add or would you like to comment on the matter? And if the answer is yes, I need to swear you in. I'll just say something uh, quick. So if you swear me in. That'd yeah, be you solemnly swear the testimony you give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Proceed, please, sir. I just wanted to thank uh, Mr. Eversall for, uh, for a good presentation. I don't think I really need to go through the um, you know project description because he, he covered very well. So I just basically wanted to thank both uh, VIMS and, and staff for, you know, trying to work together to figure out a way to get this project, you know, accomplished in that, um, you know, that time period because um, 
those winter months are a tough time to do construction and um, you know having about five and a half months if uh, we do need to wait until September if SAV is pre present um, should allow the project to continue um, you know during those winter months for that removal so just wanted to, to offer offer thanks for that and open for any um, any questions the commission might have any questions about members of the commission for mr. gray Thank you, Mr. Gray. Is the applicant present? I have a William McCahill from Dominion. Is he on the line? Uh, yes, sir. Sorry about that. I believe I was just unmuted. This is William McCahill with Dominion Energy. Thank you, Mr. McCahill. Do you have anything to add that you would like to, to address the commission? I am available for questions, but at this time, um, I do not have any comments. I'd like to thank Mr. Eversole for his help. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. McCahill of Dominion by members of the commission? All right. Seeing none, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to be heard for or against this project? The hearing none. I have one question for staff. Mr. Watkinson, do we have to issue two separate permits with two separate votes on this? For both title and subaqueous, or can they, are they combination? I don't recall. Um, I think it can be one vote to cover both. When we issue this permit, uh, one document will cover both aspects of the project, referring to the tidal wetlands and the state-owned submerged lands that are impacted. All right, not to dispute you, but this is a big project. Uh, Ms. Block, do you have any comment on that? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Matters before the commission for action. Chair will entertain a motion. Move to approve staff recommendations to Dr. Neal. Dr. Neal. I second it, Zedrin. By the way, while you, while there's a little delay in between the motion and the second, I'm, I'm writing the motion sheet out. So that's why it seems to be a little bit of a delay, so. Mr. France. Aye. Mr. Tankard. Aye. Mr. Zedrin. Mr. Zedrin. Aye. Sir, Dr. Neal. Aye. Howard's absent. Mr. Minor. Ms. Lusk. Hi. Ms. Everett. Hi. Chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Next item I have on the agenda is the Portobago Bay Homeowners Association Incorporated number 20-1526. That would be Mr. Woodward. Yes, good morning, uh, Commissioner Bowman, Associate Commissioners, long time no see. You have you sworn? Uh, yes, I was sworn. Please. Proceed. Okay, Portobago Bay Homeowners Association Incorporated is requesting authorization to install 194 linear feet of stone filled Gabion basket breakwater with clean sand fill and wetland planting to create a living shoreline on the Rappahannock River at 29481 East Point Port in Caroline County. Uh, like Arlington County, Caroline County has not adopted the wetlands ordinance, so the commission will be acting as the wetlands board. Um, there are also subaqueous bed permits required. Uh, so similar to last project, uh, you'll be um, looking at both uh, aspects of this project. Next slide, please, Mike. Um, project is located on the upper Rappahannock River, approximately four miles downriver from Port Royal. If you look up to the left, upper left uh, corner of the slide, you'll see the bridge, 301 bridge over the river there at Port Royal. Come downstream, the Portobago Bay homeowners uh, subdivision is in that little embayment there. Um, next slide, please. Thanks, Mike. It's just hanging up for a second. Okay. I'll go on. Um, the project is uh, uh, 
at the location of an existing community uh, access. There's a pier and you see a boat ramp to the east or right hand side of the pier. And then to the right of that down river of the ramp is an area of, of tidal vegetated wetlands. Uh, the proposed stone filled gabion baskets will function as a marsh sill structure to protect uh, the existing marsh. They will be backfilled, the gabions will be backfilled with, with uh, uh, the area will be backfilled with sandy sediment that's periodically removed from the ramp uh, to an elevation no higher than mean high water to perpetuate vegetated wetland substrate. The baskets will be three feet wide by three feet tall and filled with smaller stone, uh, what might be considered core stone if this were a breakwater, but they're contained within the gabion basket structure. I have a representative photograph of that in a second. Um, the baskets and some of the fill will be located on submerged lands, channelward of mean low water, while the remainder of the fill will be placed on the landward side of the sill structure um, on the intertidal uh, existing wetlands. All of the fill area behind the baskets will be planted with wetland vegetation, including Spartina alterniflora and Spartina patens, which is outlined in the applications uh, living shoreline maintenance and monitoring plan that was submitted with the application. Uh, next slide, please. These are the plans submitted with the project. On the left hand side is a plan view drawing. Um, you can again start at the dock to get orientation. And on the on just on the uh, far end where the marker is now, just offshore of the existing vegetation will be, I call it a ribbon, will be a, uh, a line of gabion baskets, uh, land, I mean, channelward of the existing vegetation. As you go up, there is a gap to allow for intertidal flow right there. And then it again picks up and wraps around the other end of the uh, existing vegetation. On the right hand side, you see a section view drawing. This is actually a revised drawing to take into account the VIMS comments, which recommended more of a gentle slope for the wetland area behind, or in this case, left of the Gabion basket structure at a 10 to one to 20 to one slope to give more of a natural contour to allow the existing vegetated wetlands and the new, uh, wetland plants uh, to survive better. Again, you see the baskets three feet by three feet. Um, and there is a variable width of the existing uh, vegetation there. Um, it, it's, it's pretty wide. The structure is gonna be as much protective um, as it will be enhancement um, for uh, the existing marsh. Next slide, please. Um, some site, some site photos. I'm, I'm on the left-hand photo. I'm standing on the pier, looking back toward the ramp, and then again to the left of the ramp is the exi existing marsh fringe, which will be protected. Um, the right-hand photo shows where the existing marsh is. The gabion will basically um, be installed around uh, channelward of the existing vegetation and the structure will act to protect um, the existing as well as enhance the newly planted stuff. And I just added uh, a picture, a schematic of, of what a gabion basket is. Um, again, they can be variable height and variable width and length and so forth, but these are to be three feet high by three feet wide um, with a length and they basically are filled with stone. It's almost like a crab pot filled with stone, uh, laid on filter cloth um, and it, allows for more of a contour to uh, mimic the existing uh, curv curvilinear shape of the marsh. They're not limited to uh, right angles in this case. Um, we'll leave that there and I'll go into uh, the, re the remainder of my evaluation. <clears throat> the project will impact both jurisdictional title wetlands and submerged land of the Commonwealth. Caroline County has not adopted the wetlands ordinance as provided for in code. Accordingly, the commission is functioning as the wetland board for review of this project, as well as reviewing those subtitle impacts. A total of 1,651 square feet of impact to submerged land will re result from the baskets 
and 300 square feet of vegetated wetlands will be impacted by additional square, I mean, by additional clean sand fill uh, to support and raise the elevation to support additional wetland plantings. The project is designed to protect, enhance, and expand an existing tidal marsh fringe adjacent to a community use pier. Gaby and basket structure will act to retain coarse grain sediments that will periodically be removed from the boat ramp, allowing the ramp's continued safe and effective use by the community for access to the river while protecting and preserving the adjacent vegetated wetland area. None of the existing vegetation will be disturbed by the baskets as the structure will be installed channel of the mean low water line and all vegetation. There will be no loss of vegetated wetlands, but rather a gain of approximately 1,351 square feet of vegetated wetland habitat. In addition, the Stonefield Gabion basket structure itself will act as a subtitle and inter intertidal habitat in itself, providing substrate for encrusting organisms and interstitial space for other small and juvenile estuarine fauna. The Institute of Marine Science indicates there is no concern with periodically using the accumulated sediments on the ramp as nourishment for the marsh, but did recommend a more gentle slope behind the sill structure that was represented in the revised drawing I showed earlier. Um, and that will allow proper function of the wetland area over time. In addition, BIMS recommended care be taken during initial placement of material as well as during periodic cleaning of the ramp so as to minimize disturbance to the existing uh, vegetation and any newly planted vegetation. Therefore, after evaluating the merits of the project and considering all of the factors contained in 282.13.02.10b in the Code of Virginia and the Wetlands Mitigation Policy and Supplemental Guidelines and uh, our subaqueous guidelines, staff recommends approval of both the wetland and subaqueous bed permits in this matter. Again, it will actually be one permit for, for both uh, impact areas. Staff believes this is a wetland creation slash enhancement proposal and does not recommend any further compensation as the project appears to be self-mitigating. Furthermore, we do not recommend a royalty for the placement of the sill structure um, or nourishment on state bottom since the structure um, will actually represent a habitat in and of itself, a conversion of sand bottom habitat um, for vegetated wetlands. That's all I have. Um, I stand by for questions. I believe Mr. Flora with the Homeowners Association is in attendance. I did not see any members from uh, Bay Design Group, who is the agent for the project, but they may have chimed in. I don't know. All right, thank you, sir. Before we go any further, I know we're working from home. If y'all could check your uh, your microphone and mute buttons. If you're not speaking, if you could mute them. I'm hearing a lot of background noise. It sounds like something shuffling or whatever. It's very difficult to understand under these circumstances, but please try to, to maintain that mute unless you're speaking. Um, any questions for Mr. Woodward by members of the commission? Mr. Bowman, Christy Everett, two quick questions, if I may. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Everett. Thank you. Um, so it looks like obviously the uh, 20 to 1 to 10 to 1 slope uh, that Vim suggested was addressed. The second item that um, care be taken during placement and periodic cleaning of the ramp, is that a permit condition or just kind of general advice? That's question one and two just for expediency. Um, based on the um, visual I'm seeing, it doesn't seem like there's um, a very large opening between the two gabion basket structures. Um, and I just didn't know if it was considered ample um, flow, tidal flow, um, for, to exchange just, you know, for water um, for tide and, and habitat, or if that was seen as an issue that either um, engineers or uh, them thought there was area to prove upon. So sorry for the long-winded questions. I'll mute now and take those answers. Um, I, I will try to answer them in reverse order. Um, the, the gap, is it's generally required for at least a five foot wide gap every hundred feet. Um, I believe that's, the, I don't have the detail on that right here, but it, it appears to be, uh, if I were to scale it approximately that, that amount. I would also say that on the southeastern end, 
where the word existing marsh and the arrow goes in, that, that remains open. Um, so you've got the tidal flow that will come in along the shoreline on the southeast end, as well as through the gap, as well as um, as, as far as tidal water flow, the water flows through these things pretty, pretty well. Um, as far as critters go, uh, they can, um, the little guys can get, get through it. The, the, the bigger predator species may have a difficult time getting through the, the gap, but again, there's a large opening on the, uh, the south uh, eastern side of the structure. Um, to your question about care be taken, um, I'm assuming we could add that as a permit condition. I, I didn't intend it that way. More of, uh, as you said, a, a guidance and reminder for the folks that are doing this work. Obviously, they're going to spend a lot of money uh, to protect uh, the marsh that's there uh, with a little extra care um, goes a long way. Perhaps the uh, uh, applicants can speak to that or, or Tony may want to chime in as well as to whether or not we want to make it an actual permit condition. Further questions, Ms. Everett? No, thank you so much. Okay. Mr. Watkinson, did you have any comment on that or anyone from VIMS wish to discuss or comment on it? Uh, this is Tony. Uh, in this case, given the design of the project and the intent to maintain a living shoreline by the applicant, uh, we didn't intend for it to be a specific permit condition, so it was just more general guidance, I think, is the appropriate way to proceed. But if the commission wishes us to craft a permit condition along those lines, we can certainly do that as well. Are you satisfied with it the way it is? Sir. Okay, thank you. Further questions by members of the commission? Thank you. I see Ms. Ms. Flora of the Homeowners Association. Ms. Flora, would you like to speak to this matter? I'm sorry, Mr. Flora. Hey, Mr. Commissioner. Um, Chris Flora is not connected to audio right now, but I do have two call-in users that I'm going to unmute to see if he is one of those. Okay. Is there anyone right. from the... Yeah. Is... Yes, sir. Would you like to speak? Uh, no, everything. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, you know considering this project in our behalf of Portobacco Bay. And um, the only comment that I could throw out there is, you know, you're looking at over a hundred and uh, some odd feet of a uh, project. We would like to do this all the stages, maybe break it into maybe you know four runs at it, coming from shoreline and using the clean material that we uh, create in the boat ramp area. And, and that would be less impact on the on existing wetlands that are already there. Okay, thank you, sir. Any questions of the gentleman, the members of the commission? I know he wasn't sworn, but I'm not so sure what materialistic or material issues that came up. So therefore, uh, is Bay Design Group on the line? Wayne Savage or Jane Sw Jay Swift? They wish Jason Swift. They wish to be heard. Okay. Any further questions by members of the commission? This is a public hearing. Does anyone in the audience wish to be heard on this matter in support of this matter? Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to oppose this matter? They are hearing none. The matter is before the commission for discussion and action. Mr. Commissioner, Ed Tankard. Yes, sir, Mr. Tankard. I, I move that we approve this Port Tobago Bay project, both uh, in the wetlands part and the spacious bottom part. I want to tell Swift. Thank, thank you, Mr. Tankard. Is there a second? Chrissy Everett can second. Thank you, Ms. Everett. Mr. France? Aye. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Tankard? Aye. Uh, Mr. Zedrin? Aye. Dr. Neal? Aye. Mr. Miner? Ms. Lusk? Aye. Ms. Everett? Aye. 
Chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Woodward. The next item I have on my agenda is the YMCA of Southampton Roads, number 19-1496, Ms. Allison Lay. Good morning. Good morning. Um, <laughs> all right, so to start off, this is the application that was heard during the February 2020 commission meeting. We were talking about it. Yes. Yep. And then it was continued um, to give the applicant and protesters some time to try to come to an agreement with each other, as well as to review the SAV mitigation plan. Um, so just a reminder, this project is a request to install two offshore breakwaters uh, totaling approximately 676 linear feet and to an extend an existing breakwater approximately 30 linear feet, as well as to install a stormwater outfall pipe and nourish the area landward of the breakwaters with beach quality sand. This project is situated along the Chesapeake Bay adjacent to the YMCA camp in the Silver Beach area of Northampton County. Next slide. Next slide, please. Sorry, this is hanging up. All right, so this is um, a map showing the location of the project. It is located seven and a half miles southwest of the town of Exmoor along the Chesapeake Bay. Next slide. This is an aerial photo. Um, the project is located south of four permitted breakwaters um, that you can see towards the top of the image. The YMCA has approximately 1,100 feet of shoreline, and then the Downing Beach area immediately south of the YMCA camp is followed by the Silver Beach area. Next slide. There is severe erosion along the upland and beach interface with a substantial scarp running along most of the property. The erosion rate since 2002 has been 3.6 feet per year, However, since the installation of the adjacent northern breakwaters in 2010 or 2011, the YMCA property has averaged over five feet of erosion per year. The adjacent property south of the camp property is the Downing Beach area, and that has seen very little erosion since 2002. Next slide. This is a map showing the SAV that is present in the area. Um, the applicant is proposing two new breakwaters as well as a breakwater extension, and there will be 4,175 square feet of SAV within the project area that will be lost. Next slide. This is a plan view drawing showing the two proposed breakwaters and the extension of the northern breakwater as well as the proposed beach nourishment. Next slide. This image shows a closer view of the southern part of the project. The proposed project is shown to not encroach over the southern property line. Next slide. This image shows the northern part of the project, which has the impacts to SAV. The blue cross-hatch section indicates the part of the project that will be constructed on SAV. Next slide. These are cross-section drawings of the project showing the proposed breakwaters and the beach nourishment behind them. Next slide. This is a photo of the site looking south from the existing breakwater. Next slide. This image is further south along the beach looking towards the Downing Beach area. Next slide. And this image is looking north towards the project area from the Downing Beach area. Next slide. Upon completion, the project will result in a conversion of 20,397 square feet of submerged land to intertidal riprap and 39,748 square feet of submerged land to beach. This will require a royalty of $1,987.40 at a rate of 5 cents per square foot. 
An outfall pipe will also be placed under 37 linear feet of submerged land. This will require a royalty of $111 at a rate of $3 per linear foot. And as I mentioned before, there will also be 4,175 square feet of impact to SAV, and this is proposed to be mitigated for at the Pocosin Flats area by VIMS. Next slide. VIMS did provide comments on this project. Um, and to summarize, they said that the proposed structures are likely to function well to address the erosion of the beach and protect the non-tidal freshwater wetland and pond situated landward of the existing beach and dune. There are direct impacts to SAV along the northern breakwater and spur off the existing breakwater to the north. However, the design of these structures has resulted in minimizing these impacts while retaining functionality. They recommend consideration of compensatory mitigation for any direct impacts to SAV. In addition, any breakwater system is likely to impact the shoreline immediately downdrift to an unknown degree. The proposed project appears to have been designed to minimize these impacts, both by the shape of the southern breakwater and the addition of sand nourishment stabilized with plantings. If significant if significant impacts to the downdrift shoreline are observed as the new configuration equilibrates, additional sand nourishment could be added near the southern structure. Next slide. Uh, the other comments that were received on this project, uh, the Northampton County Wetlands and Dunes Board did approve their portion of the project in December 2019. The Department of Wildlife Resources anticipates no significant adverse impacts upon listed species or designated resources under their jurisdiction. And the Department of Conservation and Recreation recommends an inventory for the Northeastern Beach Tiger Beetle be conducted in the project area. Uh, to address this, it is staff's understanding that the applicant has agreed to the Army Corps of Engineers special conditions for the protection of the Northeastern Beach Tiger Beetles in their pending Regional Permit 19 uh, and that time period would be April 15th through September 15th. Next slide. Uh, the adjacent property owners did have some concerns about the project. There are four adjacent property owners who own approximately 950 feet of shoreline south of and down drift of the YMCA, and they have protested the project. Their property includes six individual lots and one community parcel, the latter of which is situated immediately adjacent to Camp Silver Beach. They are concerned that the breakwaters will cause erosion to their dunes and beach, which are not experiencing a great deal of erosion at this time. They also have concerns that a portion of the southern breakwater and beach nourishment will be either on their property or in their riparian area. Next slide. At the February 25th, 2020 commission meeting, the applicant and protesters agreed to work to find a resolution by September 2020. Several phone meetings have been held between the YMCA and the protesters. However, no further resolution has been reached. The YMCA had agreed to fund a third party review of the design to determine any impacts that may occur to the protesters' property. However, the protesters had trouble finding a third party group to conduct the evaluation. They recently hired someone to perform the evaluation, but have not yet provided the results of that evaluation. Additionally, the commission also asked that mitigation for SAV, SAV be considered in Chesapeake Bay instead of on the seaside. The contract with VIMS for SAV mitigation has been revised so that the SAV mitigation will occur at the Pocosin Flats area instead of on the seaside of the Eastern Shore. The YMCA would like to move forward with this application as it was presented at the February meeting with the revised SAV contract. They would like to complete the construction on the project before the time of year restriction for the Northeastern Beach Tiger Beetles that is proposed on their Army Corps of Engineer Regional Permit 19. This time of year restriction would be from April 15 to September 15. Next slide. While we are sensitive to the protesters' concerns, it appears that the project has been designed to minimize the potential for adverse effects along the adjoining southern beach while providing protection for the applicant's eroding shoreline. As suggested by our shoreline development BNPs, the breakwater project appears to have been designed to address the specific site conditions such as the wave climate and the material composition and has been designed within an appropriate spacing and distance offshore. 
Therefore, after evaluating the merits of the project and after considering all of the factors contained in 28.2-1205A of the Code of Virginia and the concerns of the protesters, staff recommends approval of the applicant's breakwater system. In addition, we recommend compensatory mitigation for 4,175 square feet of direct impact to SAV in conformance with the submitted plan to fund VIM seeding activity in the Pocosin Flats area. We further recommend a one-time royalty in the amount of $1,987.40 be assessed for the subaqueous beach nourishment fill over 39,748 square feet at a rate of five cents per square foot and a one-time royalty of $111 for the outfall pipe encroachment under 37 feet of state-owned subaqueous bottom at a rate of $3 per linear foot. And that concludes my presentation, and I will take any questions at this time. Thank you, Allison. Great presentation. Um, any questions by Ms. from Ms. Lay by members of the commission? John Zedrin here. Mr. Zedrin. Uh, what this the same project that came before us uh, a year or two ago? No, sir. It actually came before us in February. As I recall, we sent it back with the hope that, uh, as we do from time to time, that there could be something worked out uh, between the applicant and the protestant. And as I understand, by virtue of this evaluation uh, and what I've heard, that that has not occurred. But that yes, sir, we have heard this issue before. And a second question. Uh, uh, I understand they've uh, secured a third party to uh, come up with an uh, evaluation uh, and it has not been completed yet. Why would we want to uh, go forward with this today without having that report? So we were asked by the YMCA to go ahead and hear this application so that they can work around the time of year restriction. And since the amount of time that was requested for the continuance in February has passed, we decided to go ahead and take it this month. Yes, sir. Mr. Zedrin, to clarify, this matter was uh, heard on February 25th, 2020. Um, and according to the evaluation as I read it, they uh, had trouble finding someone. I, I, I'm no, I don't know what we will hear from the protestants. You may ask the question under cross uh, as to why it's taken this period of time with the uh, with engineering firms that are available. But uh, uh, I think that uh, we'll hear that time is of the essence now due to the tiger beetle issue versus the uh, the significant erosion issue. But I'll. I'll let them play that out when it comes out. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, this is Tony. Uh, I'd like to also add that, uh, as I recall, during the February meeting, the commission asked that we actually plan to bring this back uh, in September. Uh, however, the applicant had asked that we defer that a month to give them a little bit more opportunity to try and work things out, and that didn't occur. So, uh, and. In a sense, we're, we brought this back as well because of the commission directed that we bring it back uh, at, at the September meeting. Thank you, sir. Uh, any follow up, Mr. Zedrin, on your questioning? Yes, sir. Okay, I presume. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Everett. Yeah, just a quick question for Ms. Lay, if that would be allowable. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Ms. Lay, you mentioned the Pocosin Flats is the chosen, or essentially mitigation of the SAV, not on the Eastern Shore. Um, is that, or not, maybe you said not on the Eastern Shore Seaside, but um, Pocosin Flats seems like a, a good idea. I just wanted to know a little bit more about why that was chosen. Is it because it's another agreeable mitigation site that's considered most likely to be successful within the Bay? Just want a little more info as background. Yeah, I think VIMS may be able to provide more information than me, but to my understanding, Pocosin Flats is another one of the areas that they typically uh, do SAV seeding at, um, and it is on the bay side instead of on the sea side, which was recommend or um, asked for by the commission at the meeting in February. Great, that's perfect, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Everett. Further questions from Ms. Lay by members of the commission? 
I have one for Tony, if I could. And Mr. Tankard, proceed, please. Yes, sir. I, did both parties understand, Tony, that there was a end date, uh, sort, sort of a, when we wanted to bring this back, that, that they needed to work under a timeline of sorts? Would have been my understanding, yes. That was a pretty clear uh, decision, I think, or direction by the commission uh, back in February. Thank you, sir. And then I have one follow-up for Ms. Lay, if I could. Please proceed. You know, just being, it's, this is an Eastern Shore project, um, Eastern Shore of Subaqueous Bottom. I do feel strange that we're sending this, uh, what would be a positive charge, for lack of a better word, of, of Subaqueous Bottom, um, that we're sending it across the bay. There's no place we could have done it on the Eastern Shore of Virginia Bayside. So it is my understanding that the Potosin Flats area was the closest bayside location for SAV seating. Um, Vince may be able to answer that a little better than me, though. Mr. Varnell or Ms. Hine? Yes, this is Emily Hine from VIMS. Um, Allison Lee is correct that the Pocosin Flats area is the closest SAV mitigation site that we have to this project location. Any follow up to that, Mr. Tankard? I know that may yes, have... yes, I just have one follow up. Uh, just Go for ahead, my Mr. own edification uh, and maybe for, for the minutes, what does it take to have a, a site that would be like this? Because I suspect we're going to see more of this over time and that I'd hate to send everything across the bay and nothing against the folks over there by any means, but. I just feel like uh, subaqueous bottom, but gets more subaqueous bottom, it seems like, from what we've seen. And I'd, I'd hate to miss the opportunity to have more or more grassland in subaqueous bottom, have that opportunity over here. Certainly, I understand. Um, there's a number of factors that uh, contribute to site suitability for SAV mitigation. Um, and those include uh, user conflicts, uh, you know, have actually having the space um, that is at appropriate water depths to successfully propagate SAV, in this case, eelgrass, um, as well as um, not having, uh, you know, areas that, that already, are already colonized um, out to their farthest depths uh, would be, you know, when you can't add more SAV where it's already at its fullest extent. Um, I know that doctors Orth and Patrick are uh, looking for additional sites around the bay for future projects, but at this point, because flats is the best available at the moment. Uh, Commissioner Bowman, okay. this is this is Thank Mark Lukenbach. Can I can I help add one thing from Mr. Tankard? Dr. Lukenbach, you were you sworn at the same time staff was sworn? Uh, yes. Okay, sure. Proceed, please. Uh, the the uh, Mr. Tankard um, and and certainly uh, VMRC staff speak to this as well. Um, in in wanting to formally designate an area for SAV mitigation, um, we also have and, and uh, Ms. Hines spoke to this, but I want to be specific about it with respect to shellfish aquaculture. Um, to formally designate a place that we would do that. Uh, the VMRC would designate as a place for mitigation and, and, and restoration, in essence, we'd want to, you know, get public comment from the aquaculturists nearby, uh, you know, un, uh, unassigned bottom that might, that, that might be suitable for aquaculture. Um, that just needs, it just needs to have some internal review and, and comments by the aquaculture industry and, and for staff to formally identify it as a, as a restoration or mitigation location. That, that's all. Thank you, Dr. Lukenbach. Any, any follow up for Dr. Lukenbach in reference to his response? All right. Any further questions of staff or VIMS at the present time by members of the commission? We're seeing none. I see. I'm sorry. Okay. Must have been feedback. Um, I note that uh, the applicant is represented by Mr. Brian Plumley of Poolbrook Plumley PC. 
Presenting on behalf of the YMCA, Mr. Plumley, are you here? Yes, I am. Can you hear me, Commissioner? I can hear you loud and clear, Mr. Plumley. Um, if you'd like to proceed. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Commissioner Bowman. Commissioners, um, I'm Brian Plumley with Coolbrook Plumley. On behalf of the Y, VHB submitted a joint application in August of 2019 seeking permission to construct this breakwater. It's actually a living shoreline which is sufficient to protect and restore the wise beaches and the property at Camp Silver Beach. We certainly appreciate the staff's review and the uh, second recommendation for approval, the first by Hank in February and now by Ms. Lay today. Our law firm, we've been privileged and honored to be the wise counsel for well over 30 years in Southampton Roads. Uh, as you know, the mission of the Y is to put Christian principles into practice through programs that build healthy spirit, mind and body for all. I know each of you is aware of the why up to the time of this pandemic has hosted thousands of children and countless families at this camp for decades. And it's very hopeful that the camp may be opened in full and its beaches will be ready this summer to host the families again. Rather than merely construct a bulkhead by right, the why is seeking your authority to spend approximately $1 million to build a breakwater system which VIMS reviewed in October of 2019 and determined to be, quote, designed to minimize impacts to the downdrift shoreline, both by the shape of the southern breakwater and the addition of sand nourishment stabilized with plantings. That was Ms. Hine, and she's obviously part of this hearing today. So for decades, what's been going on is there's been hardening of the beaches to the north of Camp Silver Beach. That's been the norm, primarily bulkheads. And in 2009, the VMRC grounded our neighbor, immediate neighbor to the north, four breakwaters, one 250 foot long and three of them 150 foot long. And it was all done by consent. The Y did not object to the breakwater to the north, but since the construction in November of 2009, um, Camp Silver Beach has suffered many feet of loss almost every year, particularly after large storms. Fortunately, with this project, the property owners to the north have agreed to allow the Y to tie into their breakwater system. Now, and discussing our neighbors to the south, the Y first met the neighbors to the south when it appeared um, before the Northampton Wetlands Board in December of 2019. And it was during that proceeding that the neighbors asked the Y to accommodate them by reducing the extension of the southern breakwater so it would not encroach on their riparian line. And I think Allison showed that. Um, the original design extended further south as an effort to minimize further and minimize impacts by giving more protection, but the neighbors asked that that component be pushed back and that was done. Um, and that was agreed to before the wetlands board. I also think it's important to let you know that at that hearing or at a meeting on the same day with the folks uh, to the south, the chairman of the YMCA at that time agreed that the Y would pay the cost for the neighbors to hire uh, their own waterfront engineer up to $10,000 so they could have an independent engineer review their project to assist them in the process. So that was in December of 2019 when the Y made that offer. The Y did not make that contingent upon any promise from them for any support before the VMRC. So on February 24th, 2020, the Y appeared before you at the hearing. It wasn't by consent. There was objections from the neighbors to the, uh, to the South and they had not hired a consultant at that time. Now I listened to the hearing and it appeared the consensus, obviously that we should spend more time to try to reach a, a resolution. The project got postponed obviously to avoid the impact of the tiger beetle. Um, and to give proper time for there to be discussion. There were virtual meetings over the summer in July and August, letters, phone calls, emails. I've got the details of those meetings. I wasn't part of them. I was hired sort of late in this process to review this and to make this presentation. <clears throat> but not until October 15th of this month did the neighbors hire a consultant, Mr. Scott Douglas of Alabama. Um, he requested a retainer in the amount of $2,000. And it's my understanding the Y has processed his request. They had to get his W-2 information. And the check is, has been cut or is being cut this week and sent to him this week. So the Y didn't offer 
to pay for the consultant upon any agreement that they neighbors go along with the Y. That wasn't done. The Y is going to pay the money for the same reason. It didn't object to the project to the north. The Y is trying to be a good neighbor in both directions. It wants a camp for families. It doesn't want trouble with neighbors. It just doesn't do the Y any good. But unfortunately, there are time constraints. The beach is dwindling. I have to emphasize there's a special need to get your approval today. The Y has to reactivate its application to the Army Corps of Engineers, which was put on hold pending resolution of these issues. That's going to take time. We obviously need to start and finish construction before the tiger beetle spawning season. Um, so I know the protection of the neighbors to the south is preeminent on your mind. And the Y is not intending to leave these folks with nothing they've, they've offered from the beginning to help them uh, through this process. I've asked Allison to put a um, slide into this to show the, the standard um, um, conditions on a permit. Um, and I think if you go to the very end of her presentation and past it, you'll see what the conditions are perhaps. Um, Hey, I apologize. I faced and I forgot to add that to the end of the presentation. I'm so sorry. No worries. That's okay. I, I can read it. It's on every permit. So the fo folks north of us and the folks north of them, anybody with the permit from the VMRC has this same standard condition. And it says this, it's number seven. It says the permittee shall to the greatest extent practicable minimize the adverse effects of the project upon adjacent properties and wetlands and upon the natural resources of the commonwealth so thems has said it we've had testimony from our engineer from vhb mr neville reynolds um, who has said it that that is what we've attempted to do all along and we're going to continue i think the consulting uh the consultant is asking for five thousand dollars to review uh, the WISE project and, and the WISE is going to pay it. They've agreed to pay that up to $10,000 for that work to be done and the WISE not backing out of that promise. So the WISE acted in good faith with its neighbors, designed the project can, to minimize impacts to the greatest degree practicable, which is required under the law. Mr. Neville Reynolds is available. He's a geologist, geologist um, um, and he's been at the site, reviewed everything, prepared these plans, submitted the application. He's here uh, to answer any questions about the design of the project. Also, Bill Zazinski of the Y is here to, present, to uh, provide any answers to any questions about the Y's operation. And I just would add, finally, typically living shoreline projects, which this has been found to be by staff, are not required to pay a royalty, but the Y is in agreement to pay the royalty. Um, we have deadlines on our wetlands permit, which comes up in December, a year anniversary. We need to get going with our construction to comply with the season that I described. And certainly I'll answer any questions that you all have, and I appreciate your time very much. Thank you, Councillor. Any questions of Mr. Pumley by members of the commission? And if you're not talking, could you please mute your phone or your microphone? Any questions? Any questions? All right, Mr. Plumley, um, since you're presenting in your council, do you, do you wish to uh, direct who would you would like to have speak or are you gonna just let us go ahead with the flow? I think you all heard from uh, the engineer and you've heard from the why on the prior hearing and I certainly want to be as efficient as possible allow the opponents to present and I'd like the opportunity to provide any rebuttal perhaps if there are no questions um, now maybe after uh, that if there are questions for our engineer and Mr. Zazemski from the why uh, they can stay on and answer those questions so I think at this point we'll just let if, if it's permissible Mr. Commissioner we'll just proceed with that if that's okay. That's fine with me. Anyone here in opposition to this project? I see the protestants of Dr. Kermit Ashby and Mr. James de Graffenreit. Uh, is Dr. Kermit Ashby on the phone? I am, sir. 
Sir, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you'll give me will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, self you God? I do. Could, would you like to address the commission? Yes, sir. Proceed, please. Um, with all due respect to the Y and their legal representation, uh, most of what he presented uh, was accurate. Um, the it has been said more than once that we had trouble finding a uh, impartial. We were looking for an impartial engineer to vet what the Y had presented to us as being um, a means of mitigation for effects on our beach from their engineer and construction firm um, back in November of 2019. Um, we subsequently did uh, present that uh, discussion at the February meeting, which you're aware of. And <clears throat> um, I remind you that uh, the um, degree of erosion was accelerated significantly um, at the WISE property following the um, the uh, installation of the uh, breakwaters to the north of them. Um, and in the minutes of that meeting, the statement was made, the adjacent property south of the camp property has seen very little erosion since 2002. Uh, preceding that statement, the, it stated that since 2002, there had been 3.6 feet per year of erosion at the Y. However, since the installation of the adjacent northern breakwaters in 2010 or 2011, the YMCA property has averaged over five feet of erosion per year. Again, the final statement being the adjacent property south of camp of the camp property has seen very little erosion since 2002. So our consultation with uh, VIMS people, um, Mr. Scott Hardaway specifically, um, who I'm sure all of uh, the uh, MRC staff are well acquainted with, uh, as well as the engineer of South Coast Engineers, Mr. Scott Douglas, who we have retained, Mr. I think it's Mr. Plumley. Is that correct? Uh, indicated that uh, the actual contract was dated October 15th. We had been in discussion with Mr. Scott Douglas or Dr. Scott Douglas of South Coast Engineers um, because two, we, two engineers prior to that uh, that we had uh, contacted in the summer during the time that we were having these meetings with the Y, um, both expressed a conflict because they had worked with uh, VHB, uh, the engineering firm for um, the Y. Subsequently, Scott Douglas was identified. That was early in September. Uh, we began discussions with him. However, as most of you may know, uh, they are on the Southern coast and they have dealt with Laura and Delta, two hurricanes, which significantly impacted their means of communication and his ability to uh, do anything uh, for us because he was a bit occupied with some other things. Furthermore, um, he made an effort to contact me, which he did uh, back in uh, late September, and he said that he was going to be able to get things done. Uh, he, I spoke with him as late as yesterday morning, and he gave me a preliminary report of <clears throat> what they have proposed could be done to help mitigate their problem that they're creating for us um, with, uh, uh, with their design. Um, he has some objections to those designs. He said that it I told him I wanted to know what was going to be the best thing that could be done to mitigate any serious effects on our property. I don't have the diagram available to you uh, that he sent me at this time, but, um, and this was on yesterday, it was very distressing to see the degree of uh, beach erosion that we will 
uh, at some point in time uh, experience even with the project that they proposed for us. Uh, that's why we sought to have an impartial um, engineer of our choosing um, to uh, evaluate this. He did evaluate, he made recommendations that uh, these breakwaters, if you will, that they proposed for us be pulled back off the shoreline because there were two of them that were on the shoreline, um, that they be pulled back away from the shoreline in, out into the water. They have a curve to them and a third one be added. He's, that was his recommendation. Um, he is uh, finalizing that, but um, we are understanding that Hurricane Zeta is due to arrive in that area uh, in um, the next few days. So we don't know what the effects will be there on that in terms of communication, what have you. He did uh, express that he's gonna do his best to get us a final document to present to the uh, MRC. Um, while I respect the, um, the limitations of the tiger beetle mating season, which uh, begins in April through September, um, we were at the same point in February of this year, and had you all approved that permit, the way I was intending to proceed, however, um, you uh, granted us this uh, extension to try to work with the Y. It was very clear uh, at the meetings that the um, position of the Y has not changed and Mr. Plumley has stated their position and it has not changed from the inception of at least our knowledge of this project uh, being proposed uh, back in uh, September of uh, 2019 when the MRC, uh, Mr. Hank Badger sent me a letter and the Wetlands Board, who by the way had no jurisdiction on this part of the project on the breakwaters. Um, we did attend the um, Wetlands Board meetings, uh, my wife and I on behalf of the Downings Beach group, but um, the first one we went to, the Y didn't show, or they had called that morning to postpone. And then the second one, they did come and presentations were made. And at the end of that meeting, um, we had asked that uh, we uh, be able to get an engineer um, to um, look at these, what had been given to us at a November meeting, I think it was three or four days before Thanksgiving of 2019. Um, and so uh, we have done that. Again, we have no control over Mother Nature, nor does Mr. Scott Douglas or Dr. Scott Douglas. Um, and so uh, that has been a portion of the delay that we have had. Also, again, it's very clear that the wise position is firm. They do not intend to make any um, amendments they have really the only adjustments they have made so far has been to comply with what the uh, SAV uh, impact was going to be um, they have not expressed any real uh, beyond uh, Mr. Billy George who was at that time the CEO back in 2019 uh, commitment of up to ten thousand dollars for the engineering review that we had uh, requested uh, but they have not, the, the four meetings that we held this summer, which didn't really start until, I, I think we first met in April or May, maybe. No, maybe in uh, May. But um, they were, they really didn't come to any uh, uh, resolution, which is stated by uh, Ms. Lay. We, um, we, we see where the state is seeking compensation, or the recommendation is that the state receive compensation for the damages uh, or potential damages being done to the subaquatic vegetation, albeit not a tremendous amount of money. Um, but we feel that we're not being considered for any 
sort of compensation beyond um, what Mr. Plumley presented um, as being their position, which has really not changed uh, except for them pulling the southernmost breakwater back off of, uh, back away from the encroaching on our property, um, our riparian rights uh, in, uh, with that breakwater. So, Dr. Ashby, can I ask you a question? Um, it, it may. Seems, yes, please. Um, how can we determine the amount of compensation that would be adequate, fair, and appropriate if you haven't had an engineering report, a competent and complete engineering report done that would establish the amount that would be appropriate if any in this scenario thank you to answer your question um that is forthcoming we were told initially that this would cost one hundred and thirty thousand dollars to do um by the um and it, it, it wasn't by, by mr gunn who is the contractor uh who would be constructing the breakwaters uh, of course, there's permitting costs. We discussed all of this that would have to go. This, the setup that they put forth involves uh, going back to the wetlands board for permission because it's within their jurisdiction. It is not um, in the water. It is on the sh actual shoreline. Um, and so uh, that was why we may have made an, a conscious effort to get uh, that true dollar figure. Mr. Hardaway, in my meeting, in uh, the meeting that my wife and I had with him, and subsequently uh, this uh, summer, when I spoke with him again, assured me that that was a bit more than, it was going to cost more than $130,000 uh, to do construction, but it was also, because we've never given a, a cost estimate other than something uh, verbally. And the other thing was, he said that doesn't take into account what the um, maintenance of that project is going to cost um, over time. So he had made the suggestion, you read that, we get the, uh, uh, a uh, separate engineer to look at it. He okay. does know Dr. Scott Douglas and Dr. Douglas has spoken with him as well as Mr. Reynolds, as well as Mr. Gunn. Yep. So um, I think without that report, um, which is forthcoming, um, it won't, um, I, I, I can't give you a, a Okay, thing. yeah, I understand. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Any other questions? Any other, any questions by members of the commission for the good doctor? Yes, I do have a question. Mr. Tankard, proceed please. Uh, as I mentioned, as staff, uh, sir, you you were aware there was a bit of a time there was a time constraint here. Yes, we were very much aware, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. Other okay. questions? John Zedrin here. Mr. Zedrin, proceed, please. You're muted, sir. Thank you. Uh, all right, so when is this report due? We expect the report, again, um, taking into account Hurricane Zeta. But when I spoke with him yesterday, we expect the report within the next two weeks. What, what does the hurricane have to do with his report? He's already been out there and, and looked at the, uh, the property, hasn't he? No, this, this, he has not, his contract, uh, does not include actually coming to the site. He has all the documents from um, Gun, uh, Mr. Gunn's construction firm, as well as uh, everything that was presented to us. He has all the documents that Mr. Uh, Scott Hardaway presented from them, uh, has provided him with. Um, and so he is reviewing all of that to put together the final project that he thinks would be sufficient to mitigate the negative effects of the WISE project. Okay, so what does the hurricane have to do with that? Well, sir, if you've, I'm sure you've experienced a hurricane 
Uh, this is on the southern coast, and you, you're well aware of the damages that were caused by Hurricane Delta, then Laura, then followed by Hurricane Delta. Um, his offices uh, in that area, the communications means they were, they were down in terms of communications. He literally had to drive one time two hours to get a phone call back through to me to let me know that um, he was in receipt of all that information and that he was going to be working on it. He would be working on it. Okay, thank you. Further question, Mr. Zeter? Um, no. Thank you. Um, doctor, what was that gentleman's full name? The engineer? Yes, sir, please. That is Dr. Scott. First name. L. I'm sorry. No, his, his first name is Scott. Scott uh, L. Douglas. D O U G L A S S. And where is he located? He is with South Coast Engineers okay. in Fairhope, Alabama. Fairhope, okay. I, I guess the only question I've got is we have a number of engineers that come before us. I mean, I. Through the time I've been commissioner, uh, we have a lot. I just wonder what, and it's up to you to do this. It's just it seems to me like to, from a timeliness perspective, you would maybe try to find someone that wasn't suffering the travails of uh, of, of tropical storms, one right behind the other, which have occurred down there. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone a little bit closer that could have gotten a report to us. A little bit sooner or to the to the YMCA a little bit sooner, uh, like right out of the get go to maybe give us a little bit better opportunity to have the, the big picture here today. That's that's a little little disconcerting to me at this juncture. Well, I'd like to to hopefully hopefully uh, diminish the disconcerting uh, feelings that you have because again we we. Upon approaching two other engineers, engineering firms, um, they had a conflict. So we felt it, it important to go to uh, a firm that we were not going to, uh, you know, run across a conflict being the case. Um, and um, this is who we arrived at. At that time, we had no idea that Hurricane Laura. Hurricane Delta, and even now Hurricane Zeta, uh, were, were going to be a part of this whole scenario. We didn't know that. Okay, thank you, sir. Any further questions of, uh, of Dr. Ashby? Or members of the commission? I, I think, Mr. Bowman, I think, uh, Mr. DeGraff and Wright may have uh, something he would like to say on our behalf yes, sir. as well. Yes, sir. I'd be glad to get to him. Yep. Uh, Mr. DeGraff and Wright, are you, are you the on online? Yes, I am. Thank Would you, sir. Yes, sir. Good morning. Would you solemnly swear to testify that you give be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Could you proceed, please? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, allowing us the opportunity to uh, speak at your uh, uh, hearing. Truly our pleasure. Um, Dr. Ashby has um, more than adequately uh, summarized the facts, and I just want to uh, uh, hone in on um, a couple of things that have gone unsaid so that um, I can address the concerns that some of you yourself and some of your colleagues on the commission have stated. Um, timeliness. Um, we did meet in person with um, the representatives of the Y and their uh, engineers and re their retained consultants, um, as I recall, back in either late February or very early March before the coronavirus shut everything down. Uh, so we did have the opportunity to, to hear from them directly and go over all of the, the information uh, in um, great detail. And it was clear uh, from their, uh, what they presented to us in that meeting uh, was that Downing Beach, and I'm one of the property owners right on the beach, um, would suffer accelerated erosion as a result of their plans 
uh, notwithstanding the mitigation efforts represented in those plans. Um, and we agreed to uh, continue the conversations, but um, literally a few days after that, that meeting, uh, the whole state of Virginia, as did most of uh, America, shut down, and people had to scramble to, uh, 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 to, to, to conduct business in a virtual way. And um, it wasn't until May that um, the Y got the, basically it was the Y's initiative that we suspend discussions until they reconfigured how they were going to conduct business. And they, we all agreed to their schedule of meetings. Uh, so I want, I, I just want to get that on the record so you understand that we have not been dragging our feet and we have been quite sensitive as Dr. Uh, uh, Ashby has pointed out to uh, their sense of urgency about getting to a resolution. We have been very clear about what our concerns are and how those concerns could be met. And as Dr. Ashby has pointed out, uh, it really wasn't until um, our last two meetings with the Y that I got the impression that they finally heard us as property owners, you know, recognizing that your commission exists, as I understand it, uh, to uh, protect uh, fisheries, underwater uh, 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 vegetation, the dunes and the beaches um, from the perspective of the environment, but also the economic vitality of the state. Um, our interest as property owners um, uh, doesn't get suspended uh, for example, if the Y wanted to construct something on their property that would do uh, uh, damage to our property, longstanding property uh, law uh, would protect us from that. Similarly, they can, this permit that they are seeking, uh, notwithstanding the boilerplate language uh, recited by council uh, that says that to the greatest extent practicable, they should mitigate. Uh, well, we already know that there's going to be damage that needs to be mitigated. We just need to figure out whether they can modify their pro proposed project to avoid um, or uh, significantly and effectively mitigate damage to our property, that they would uh, include that modification as part of their uh, proposed project. Uh, that's something that we could, uh, as we've told them in our meetings, um, uh, work with them on as good neighbors. Um, they have not yet explained, uh, you know, I, one of the outstanding questions that we're still waiting for an answer for them from, uh, we just heard from council that they did not oppose uh, their neighbors to the north who uh, proposed to, uh, who, who got a permit uh, that has now shown uh, the, the results of uh, damage to their beach. They did not explain to us why it is that they haven't worked with their neighbors to the north to get help mitigating the damage on, on their property. They simply want to shift it downstream to us if we don't work something out. Uh, so I will uh, just um, uh, conclude my, my comments by saying, look, we um, are we're opposed, subject to being able to work this out. Uh, yes, we are sensitive to their sense of urgency, but as Dr. Ashby pointed out, last February, had they received a permit on February 25th or uh, thereabouts, whenever the meeting occurred, they were prepared uh, to move forward with their project with sufficient time prior to the uh, April 15th restriction on um, uh, the, the Beatles uh, mating season. Uh, so we're sitting here in October uh, and we know that we're going to be, we're going to get our arms around the question that you asked, sir, about how do we know what the, uh, the damages might be and how do we mitigate it, what the cost of that might be. We're going to know from our engineer uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks something concrete that we can talk to the Y about. Uh, so I would just conclude by saying I think it's premature uh, to grant the, to approve this permit uh, when we know we're on the precipice of knowing what the ex, what the extent of mitigation could be 
what that might cost, and that, that would establish a framework within which we could have a conversation with the why about how we might um, suspend, you know, avoid um, any, any further administrative delay or court delays, frankly, if we have to go to court to challenge it, uh, and um, not interfere with their construction schedule that is, uh, uh, you know, penned in by uh, the, a the April uh, 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 date on the calendar where the, uh, the mating season uh, uh, for the, uh, the Beatles uh, commences. So thank you for the opportunity to um, uh, just fill in some blanks. Uh, but I really did not want to leave you all with the impression that the Downing Beach property owners have in any way uh, been dragging our feet or slow walking this. We have uh, um, kept the Y uh, fully informed of our progress and we, it was very important to us that we have an independent review so that we could proceed in good faith uh, to uh, an amicable resolution. Okay. Um, I guess I'm just a follow up question for Dr. Ashby. Dr. Ashby, did did you procure the services of uh, of uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Douglas? Did, did you do that, or did someone else do that? Dr. Douglas is not. Oh. Dr. Douglas is not present. Uh, Dr. Douglas is an engineer. I'm, 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 ask, I'm asking. No, I I'm asking. You the question. I'm asking you the question, Dr. Ashby. Did you procure the services of oh. Dr. Douglas? Okay. Of South Engineers. Yes. You did. How long ago did you procure? How long ago yes. did y'all sign whatever you signed or agree to start work, regardless of Hurricane Zeta, Laura, all of those? How long ago did you, how long ago was that where that agreement was procured? Again, with Dr. Douglas, the, the agreement yes, with, with Dr. Dr. Douglas. Douglas was, of South Coast Engineers. Was, when did you? What, what, Yes, sir. That was early September when we talked with him. Then he said he cleared that he did not have any conflicts. He cleared that he would be able to, he reviewed the documents and he said, yes, I can do this work for you. Um, and that was early September. The actual, I presented the contract, which was dated October the 15th to the Y and to our group. But he uh, was ready to get started, but he did require a, re a retainer. And I had let the Y know that a retainer was going to be needed. In, in between that time, there was one of those hurricanes. I don't know which one. Sure. Um, I think it was Laura. There. Uh, yeah, they seem to be, you know, um, related to each other. But um, at any rate, uh, I think it was Laura, and that's when I lost communication with him. And I had uh, spoken with, well, through, I had emailed back and forth with um, the Y, Mr. Anthony Walters, and his uh, assistant, Laura Clark, that yeah. I was waiting to get the information from Dr. Douglas. So October 15th is a little bit of the line in the sand that we're dealing with. Did, um, when you talked to Dr. Douglas, did he advise you that he's not licensed uh, to do engineering work in the Commonwealth of Virginia? Yes. He did, okay. All right, I don't have any further. Any further questions of uh, Dr. I, I'm sorry? I, I was gonna say, with respect to that, we were seeking an engineering review. Right. Right, understood. Um, any other questions of Dr. Ashby or Dr. or Mr. DeGrathenite? By members of the commission. All right, thank you. This Anyone else wish to be heard in support of this project? I'm sorry, in opposition to the project. Anyone else? All right, Mr. Plumley, you had asked for time to rebut. Five minutes. Oh, there we go. I'm I'm unmuted. Okay, thank you very much. Um, 
First, with regards to the representations made to the Y, and I've got Mr. Bill Zazinski to testify this fact, but the owners in the Y had a meeting, I think by phone or Zoom, on September 16th is what the note said, where it was indicated the owners had not hired an independent engineer as of September 16th. The Y was just shown that contract last week and had, has approved the, uh, the payment. The other point is Mr. Douglas or Dr. Douglas had contact You're breaking up, Mr. Plumley. Mr. Plumley. Mr. Plumley. Hey, Steve. It looks like Mr. Plumley is having some issues with his audio. Okay. Mr. Plumley, we have lost you. Hello? Could yeah. you start over again? Mr. Plumley, you're going to have to start over again. We lost you after about the fourth word. Okay. Can you hear me now? I can, sir. I can, sir. Thank you. I, if there was any... Um, Foul words spoken while I had lost you. I hope ever I'm, I'm forgiven. The, well, only not. in your mind, likely. So go ahead. <laughs> um, so let me deal with the timing. There was a meeting, in the notes I have, there was a meeting between the owners of Downing Beach and the Y dated September 16th of this year where the owners indicated they had not hired an independent engineer as of, as of that time. And Mr. Zazinski is here to be asked questions about that if needed. But I will say that Dr. Douglas reached out yesterday, I believe, or, and perhaps maybe it was Friday, to Neville Reynolds, who's the engineer for the Y, to talk to him. And he told Mr. Uh, Reynolds of his comments. So if, the, if you'd like to hear from Mr. Reynolds about the comments that uh, Dr. Douglas shared about the project, you can. But I guess the point I'd like to strongly emphasize, and you've heard perhaps there's gonna be court action, we've gotta go before the wetlands board, we have to go through the ACOE still, there's gonna be a lot of time needed to get this project up, contractors to get out there to do this work in advance of the season. So yes, a delay could really damage the rights, of the why. However, it's not boilerplate. It's a standard provision that we do the greatest degree practical. That's an ongoing burden. That, that is in your permit so that it guarantees that we continue to work with the folks to the south and we don't leave them in the dust forgetting all about them. And I think there was a mention of, about the not objecting to the folks to the north. We're not here trying to stir up the whole, you know, domino effect of what happened north and wanting to hold out for them and et cetera, et cetera. We're trying to get this done to rectify the beaches of the Y to help the families and the kids coming to the Y. I'm not trying to be in all these are both very respectful men and, and I appreciate their comments. And I, I just want to emphasize also here in, in as quickly as I can that we're still going to hold out the offer to whatever project uh, Dr. Douglas comes up for them to connect it as part of our cooperation with them to, to connect to their system, to reduce as much cost as possible for that. Um, so if you would all like to hear um, from Rebel, or excuse me, Neville Reynolds, who spoke to uh, Dr. Um, Douglas, and he can provide you that image. But it, again, it's hearsay. Dr. Douglas could have been on the phone today to talk to you directly about his thoughts. I don't know if that's of interest to you. It's my understanding from talking to Ms., uh, Mr. Reynolds is that he didn't really have much in the way of any objection to what we're proposing. It's really about now, and I think what they're talking about is what their project would be for their protection, uh, more or less. So, you know. 
it's my understanding there's considerable savings. It's that if they were to jump in to the timing and do this along with us, it's a smaller project, it can be done in a reasonable time frame. But we have a lot to accomplish in terms of getting through ACOE, getting through wetlands, doing this uh, in a timely way. And uh, we really feel at risk and wouldn't, wouldn't want to plow through their rights in any way, feeling like, look, we started in December. We actually first met with the folks in November of 2019. Uh, I think um, one of the gentlemen was present. He's from Maryland. Another owner was from Florida. So coordination was already an issue there. In the December meeting, we offered to put up the money for the consultant. As we know, there are dozens of engineering firms in our area, all over the state, folks to reach out to that have no affiliation or work for the Y. Um, so, you know, I'm not pointing fingers. That's not really the, the purpose. I really just want to see things move along and again, reemphasize there's an ongoing obligation to work with them. It's in the permit. It's there. Um, so I'd ask you all to approve it. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Plumley. Any further questions by members of the commission for Mr. Plumley? Okay, the matters before the commission. So I, I have I have one question for Mr. Plumley, Ed Tanker. Mr. Tanker. So, Mr. Plumley, how, so how would you see the the, uh, the the two parties working together as we go forward in a in a uh, application that has been approved? What does that look like to you? Yeah, I I actually think. Knowing the project that's approved is going to provide some clarity to their engineer to put forward their project. Um, we still have, like I said, we have to go to the ACOE and the wetlands board. So they're going to appear before the wetlands board, I'm sure. And, and if there needs to be an adjustment, I think the one adjustment that's going to be made is probably to put back the southern extension that they asked for us to remove. I think that's actually going to be probably one of the recommendations coming from their folks to sort of absorb some of the costs and to assist them in that way. Well, unfortunately, because they asked us to remove that component before the wetlands board, we'd have to go back for an amendment from the wetlands board. The why we, we have tried to show our hands the entire process. We are not trying to um, take advantage of anyone. We're trying to proceed properly. And that's how I see this proceeding. And, um, you know, everyone's under the same condition that I've already outlined and, and it's there for us. So to do it to the greatest degree practicable means to the greatest degree practicable and we need to do that. So that's the message. Uh, John Zedrin has a question. Mr. Zedrin. Uh, I'd like to hear from Mr. Reynolds. You said he spoke with the engineer that they've hired and uh, I take it that, that uh, they discussed what uh, his thoughts were in reference to uh, protecting their beach. Is that right? That's correct. Is he there with you? Is he there with you? He's on the line. It's my understanding he's separately um, connected to the meeting and should be able to speak. Uh, could we see if he was on here for the commission? Yes, Mr. Neville Reynolds, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Could you tell us what the essence of that conversation was with their engineer? Um, yes, um, we talked. Uh, Mr. Before you go any further, this causes me a little concern about hearsay, but we'll, especially since the, the specter of court has been brought up. Um, but first, do you solemnly swear the testimony you'll give be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to so help you, God? I do. Before you proceed, Ms. Block, do you have any concern with this testimony? No, sir. The case law is quite clear that rules of evidence are relaxed in administrative Good. hearing and right. hearsay is permissible. Perfect. Thank you. Not not to not to uh, uh, get in front of you, Mr. Zedrin. I just want to make sure that we get this one right for sure, as all of them. So, sir, proceed. Yes, uh, we had a, a general discussion about the, the processes and the, the overall design. Um, 
kind of the parameters that led to the design that, that we have uh, before you, including the, the length of the, uh, the northern structure, which is somewhat larger and closer into shore, and what's driving that is the presence of the, the freshwater pond uh, that is, you know, right along the property line there. Um, we talked about the, uh, the feed of sand that was coming from the northern property was a coarse, a coarse sand. In fact, that sand was actually mined out of the bank to build that, uh, the project to the north. And the fact that that feed had been cut off, not just for YMCA property, but also for the properties uh, to the south of, of YMCA. Um, we talked about the, the quality of the, the beach material that was getting fed into the, into the system uh, by erosion of the dunes uh, at, at the, I should say, kind of relic dunes at the YMCA property. Uh, and the fact that that was a much finer grain material than it had been previously fed to those beaches from the north, so that there are, there are changes that are going on that have gone on. There are changes that are going to continue to go on uh, and run down that shoreline, whether this project is built or not. Uh, with respect to the actual solution or mitigating uh, uh, the impacts to the adjacent property. Um, we had some general discussions about it, and he said, "Well, you know, if you were if you were if you were going to advise the Downing Beach folks on how to stabilize their shoreline, is is the approach with these two lower crested breakwaters? Is that what you would use?" And I said, "Well, if they were part of the project." we would probably continue the relationship between the breakwaters and the beach uh, that, we, that we used on the YMCA property, but that we would very likely use these same transitional structures uh, that, that we sketched up for the Downing Beach folks back uh, around the beginning of the year, that we would use those same type of transitional structures just further to the south uh, of, of the primary uh, Downing Beach property. So it was more a discussion of more, it was more a holistic discussion of, uh, at least that's what I understood, it was a more holistic discussion of uh, kind of a permanent protection for the, the, pr the primary area of the Downing Beach uh, property, like down to the tree line, if you, if you looked at the aerials. Um, so that was kind of the context of that discussion, and I think that uh, is some of the feedback that uh, Dr. Ashby got about the structures being further offshore. Thank you. Any further questions of the gentleman? All right, thank you. Matters before the commission for discussion and action. And this is Dr. Neal. Yes, Dr. Neal. I, I remember this project very well. Um, I do not believe it was our intention. I know it was not my intention uh, to deny the why this permit. It was just to give the protestants some more time to get their ducks in a row. And here we are eight months later. Uh, and I, so I, I think the time has become more of an essence. There was that freshwater pond. I know it was in uh, very close to the uh, the shoreline, and that they're risking losing that habitat. And so, you know, I, I don't think this is something we've already delayed it eight months. This is not something we can just keep delaying forever uh, while they consult with engineers for the for their project. And so I would I would make a motion to to approve staff recommendation. So that's my motion. Thank you, Dr. Neal. Is there a second to the motion? Mr. Commissioner? Yes. Ed Tankard. I, I, I will second the motion and I'll make a comment at the same time. I, I, I'm, I'm happy that it, both parties seem to understand there was a timeline. Uh, I'm not sure why the timeline uh, got pushed back. I know the COVID has been an issue, but 
Uh, I am also happy that they have a neighbor like uh, the YMCA who is committed to working with them, and we can see that through their actions. So I think that's been demonstrated to us. So I, I, I know the area very well. I know that the erosion has, has increased over the couple of years, and uh, the camp is a great asset to the community. And so I, I think we have really have no other course but to approve this. and that the uh, parties continue to work together to create a solution that's positive for both. Thank you, Mr. Tankard. Further comments? Well, quite honestly, when we heard this case initially, I was somewhat of the opinion that there had not been significant dialogue between the two parties, especially when you deal I think I mentioned it when you deal with the YMCA, which has stellar reputation for uh, doing what they do in the community, but I, w I wanted to make sure that that, that type of, of reputation was maintained during the course of this, what is basically a business transaction and that all entities involved had an opportunity to work through um, any uh, difficulties they may have. And as it's been said, the first meeting was December the 19th is when I guess our first, when, when the hourglass started, um, the YMCA at that juncture agreed to assist them. Um, we had our meeting then on February the 24th uh, and no consultant. And then here at the, at the 11th hour uh, by, Dr. Ashby's own admission on October the 15th, some 12 days prior to the time that had been set by the commission to rehear this matter, uh, the contract is, is signed and we know that it's not fair for engineers to have to provide a full report. I guess you can do that, but that's that timeline's a little long from February the 24th. But I think from the timeline perspective, the, 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 the Commonwealth of Virginia has been more than fair as far as allowing these entities to have time to work together to do whatever they were gonna do to come up with agreement. Furthermore, from a scientific perspective, if you read the evaluation as suggest, suggested by our shoreline development, best management practices, the breakwater project appears to have been designed to address the specific site conditions, such as the wave climate and the material composition, and has been designed with an appropriate spacing and distance offshore. Any further comment? I'll call the roll. Mr. France? Aye. Mr. Tankard? Aye. Mr. Zedrin? Aye. Dr. Neal? Aye. Mr. Miner? Aye. Ms. Lusk? Aye. Ms. Everett? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much for the robust and very intelligent argument. Um, greatly appreciate it. Look forward to any works that need to be done between y'all has been promised. We certainly like to hear about those. So please. Do the very best you can to work out any potential problems. But again, I thank you for your time. I think what we'll do is we will have one more case. Um, I, I have to be cognizant of staff who is sitting there and not being able to go. But so far, as they provide these presentations where we may have the benefit of getting up and moving around a little bit. So. Um, Look, look at, looking and reading the tea leaves, it looks like the next case may take a little bit longer than, than you know, 15 or 20 minutes. Um, what's the pleasure of the commission? Would you like a 30 minute break now and then come back around 12? Or would you like to hear this case now and then break after that? It's totally up to y'all. First one speaks wins. Okay, in that case, 